we had a huge storm just yesterday the day before, like once in a hundred years storm. So everything's, everything's out. Everything's eating. The lizards are out. The birds are out. The moss is looking fantastic. I'm a big fan of Biocrust, so that's important to me. Welcome to Nature's Guardians. I'm Micah Siegel. Each week, I talk with people working to save and help animals around the world. They are nature's guardians, and you can become one too. Today, I'm talking with Alexandra Ross from the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. Welcome to this show, Alexandra. Hi, Micah. Thanks for having me. To start, tell me about your background and how you got where you are now. Uh, I have an interesting story. When I started, I was originally in chemistry, and I had one lecture from a guy named Dr. Michael Archer. And he came and did this guest lecture on like elephants and pygmy possums and how we can change conservation by thinking outside the box. It was just a one hour lecture. I took no notes. I was so focused. I could, I reckon I could deliver that lecture word for word today, like 10 years later. And I went that afternoon and changed my degree from chemistry to conservation. And I haven't looked back since. So I did my PhD in biology conservation. And was fortunate enough to get a job with the Australian Wildlife Conservancy after I finished my PhD. That's where I am now. So what do you do there at the Wildlife Conservancy of Australia? I'm lucky enough to live and work on a sanctuary. So I live at Yukamara Sanctuary, which is about two hours north of Adelaide. That's one of our cities right down the southern coast in the middle of Australia. So it's a sort of semi-arid region. Yukamara Sanctuary is 5,000 hectares uh, and we have 1,000 hectares of that which is fenced. So really important in Australia for conservation is these fenced areas which keep out some of the threats to our native animals. So animals like bilbies, numbats, betongs, which are like very small kangaroos that would be extinct otherwise um, if not for this fence protecting them in this region. And that's I'm very fortunate to live inside the fence. So I open my door in the morning and there's a numbat on my doorstep. Um, while I'm sleeping at night, I can hear the betongs fighting and possums in the trees. So it's Not many people get to say that about the place they live. So that's outside my office window. Mali is a type of habitat here, and it's also a type of tree. So we use the same word for both things. Yeah. Let me take the computer with me. Can you still? Oh, oh, not that. Ah, Yeah. Can we see the trees there? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of birds out at the moment. We had a huge storm just yesterday, the day before, like once in a hundred years storm. So everything's, everything's out. Everything's eating. The lizards are out. The birds are out. The moss is looking fantastic. I'm a big fan of Biocrust. So that's important to me. Yeah. So the Mali is super slow growing because we're in a semi-arid region. We only get like 250, 300 mils of water a year. I don't know what that is in inches. Sorry. Sorry. The Mali only grows about one centimeter in diameter every 10 years. So a millimeter a year. And so you, if you're looking at a tree that's, you know, that big, you're looking at a tree that's about 300 years old. So super slow growing ecosystem here. It means that old trees are really important. So the habitat we protect here is some of the oldest Mali in the country. We've got 600 year old trees here and they have these hollows in them that species can live in. So as soon as you cut down trees like that, people just think it's firewood. But as soon as you lose hollows, then you lose birds that nest in hollows, you lose possums, you lose reptiles, you lose mammals. So we protect a really cool habitat here. So tell us about the animals you protect. Uh, Yeah, so a couple of the species we have here have been reintroduced. So that means that they were extinct in this area. And then we built the fence to keep out some of the threats, like cats and foxes. And then we put them back in here. So the species that we reintroduced into the area are the numbat, the bilby, two species of betongs, as well as possum, and also a malleafowl. I actually have a couple of photos of those if you want to see them. Can you sing that bilby? Yes, I can. So that's a greater bilby. There was actually a lesser bilby that used to live in Australia, but it went extinct uh, a couple of decades ago. We've got species that could be going extinct if not for the work of conservationists uh, like me and others around the country. As you can see, it's a very different kind of animal. It's not something you'd expect to see. It must be for Americans like quite a weird animal to look at. The super long ears might look familiar with a rabbit, but it is in fact a marsupial. So that means it has a pouch where its babies go. So that's what the babies look like. They're born and they're about the size of a grain of rice and they crawl from where they're born from all the way into the pouch. And then they live in the pouch and that's where they do most of their growing. So for bilbies, it's one of the shortest gestations in the world. Inception to birth is about 10 days, which is super short. So 10 days after the breeding, the animals crawl into the pouch 
And then when we catch a bilby, sometimes we're lucky enough to see those babies in the pouch. We're not supposed to have favorite animals, but if I did have a favorite, this one would be up there. So this is the numbat. It's such an astonishing animal. It exclusively eats termites. And so when um, white people first arrived in Australia, they thought it was like an anteater uh, because they would sometimes find ants in the poo. Uh, and that's because they, they eat ants accidentally. So they're trying to eat termites and ants are also trying to eat termites. So they accidentally swallow an ant and then it would come out the other end fully formed as an ant because the number doesn't have the capacity to process any ant nutrients. So it's a hundred percent termite diet. It needs about 20,000 termites every single day just to survive. So that's how it got that long sticky tongue to get into little holes and get the termites out. Fantastic species. Did you say ants eat God. termites? Yeah, such an exciting thing that a lot of people don't realize. So you get ants that get into termite galleries and then they'll get the termites themselves. Termites are really soft body, so they're a super easy thing to eat. A lot of species eat them. So that includes bilbies, echidnas, numbats, of course, uh, as well as ants and other insects. Are the numbats marsupial? Yeah, they are. They are a marsupial. So like I said earlier, they, marsupials have a pouch. So the babies are born really, really early and then they finish their development in the pouch. Numbats are weird in that they don't have a fully formed pouch. They've got like, like flabby kind of thighs, I guess. And so it sort of forms a sort of pouch shape there, but it's not the same as a, as a true pouch. And then once the babies are big enough, they'll den them somewhere and to, and like bring back our food for them until they're big enough to get their own territory. Do you want to? Do you want a fun fact about numbats? Sure. There are, so you can see on this photo, those stripes on the side. So you can actually individually identify a numbat by its stripes, the same as we have thumbprints. So monitoring is really hard, making sure we know how many animals we have in the sanctuary. So one of the ways we're doing that is we put camera traps out and then we take photos of these numbats and we can identify the numbats based on their stripes. So then we can figure out how many of them we have, how far they're roaming, they have a really short life cycle. So figuring out where they're going in that time and what habitat they're using is super, super important. Do you know anything about the Tasmanian tiger? Yeah, that's such an interesting question because the numbat is one of the closest relatives of the Tasmanian tiger. So a little fact for people who like trivia, the word endling means the last animal of a species. So, for, so Benjamin, which is the last ever Tasmanian tiger that we know about, who died in uh, a zoo, that's the endling of the Tasmanian tiger. I see some roos yeah. on the left. You see some roos on the left. Yes. I, don't, I don't think I've got any roos to show you. Which one? The one Number on the top? four, I think. Oh, this is actually a cat. And I thought I would share this photo with you because it shows you how important the predator-free fenced areas are in Australia. So like I said, Yukimura's fenced and the fence is, it's got a floppy top. On the top, so a cat will climb up and get to the flop and fall back down. And so that just keeps these animals out of our sanctuaries, which is really important because Australian species don't have very good behavioral adaptation against cats. That's because the evolution of our species has been uh, separated from cats for millennia. So that means that our they've evolved so separately from cats that they don't have any idea what they are. They don't know how to protect themselves from cats. So this photo, I think, is a really good example of that. That's a, a mulga parrot here, which is one of our amazing species that occur on the sanctuary. So these cats come in and they cause an amazing devastation of species like reptiles, birds, mammals, everything they eat. And the problem that we have with cats is that they eat more than what they need. So the estimate is that every cat is eating about 10 animals every single night. And we have a couple million cats in the wild. So that, the number fluctuates. If it's a good year, you might have 6 million cats. If it's a bad year, it might be 1 or 2 million. But that means that every year we're losing billions of animals every single year just from cats. We have so many species that are close to extinction and stopping feral cats from eating them is the, one of our biggest struggles. So I told you that we reintroduced a couple of species here. But one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that you can also reintroduce birds. So we introduced some Mali fowl. This is an endangered species in Australia. The problem with malifowls is that they build their uh, nests on the ground. And these nests are enormous. So like two meters across, um, a meter high, and just like a mound of dirt and sticks and leaves. Um, so they put all this stuff on there um, and it, it's like mulch. It's sort of like ferments and uh, heats up. And so they put eggs into this pile of mulchy stuff and that keeps the eggs warm. 
And so on the tip of the Mallee beak, they have a thermometer, like a way of sensing temperature. So they put that tip in, into the top of the Mallee Sail mound, and then they'll be like, oh, too hot, take some mulch off. Oh, too cold, put some on. Oh, it's sunny, we need to protect it. Oh, it's windy, we need to, you know. And so they have this amazing capacity to keep the temperature of the inside of the nest perfect without actually laying on the eggs themselves. They're completely a nest parent. They don't know what an egg is. They don't know what the young is. If a young hatches, that's mulch now. So they kick it out if they need mulch and they kick it in if they need if they need mulch in the nest. So these great videos of Mally fowl kicking their own kids out of the nest because they don't recognize them as children. How are they doing? Like numbers, population. Mally fowl are tough to study because, you know, with our bilbies and our betongs, we can do, we can put out cage traps. If you've ever seen a betong before or you want to catch one, peanut butter and oats, like every mammal in Australia will kill their own grandma for a little bit of peanut butter and oats. So you open a trap, put some peanut butter and oats in there and you'll catch whatever it is you're trying to catch. The problem with mallee fowl is they're not going to go for it. So we can't really catch them very well. So the way that we monitor them is we find their nests. Obviously their nests are super easy to spot, two meters wide. And so we find their nest and we go back to the same nest every year and see if it's active. So where we are at the moment, we have three, four nests that we know about. Two of them are active already this year and we'll go out again next week to see if the other two have become active. They need a little bit of rain to make the leaf litter like wet to get that mulchy stuff happening. And it's been a super dry year. So, but after that rain just yesterday, hopefully they've built that mulchy mound up and we've got some more eggs being laid. I'm sure I have a betong photo here somewhere. Oh, yeah, this one's cute. It, oh my gosh, it's just a baby. All right, can you see that betong photo there? Yeah. This is a baby betong. So a betong is like a very small kangaroo. So they're about like a football size and they have everything that you would expect a kangaroo to have. They have those big feet. So that's a, a macropod, macro meaning big, pod meaning foot. But they're just a very small version of a kangaroo. kangaroo. So we have two betong species here. We have a burrowing betong and a brush-tailed betong. As the name might suggest, the burrowing betong lives in burrows and the brush-tailed betong has like a, a mohawk on the end of its tail. So this here is a burrowing betong or a booty. As you can see, it's just a little baby. But during our annual trapping, we trap a bunch of adults, we tra trap a bunch of new animals, and we tag them so that we can keep track of how they're going in the sanctuary. They have a really interesting thing that they do, which I like to not tell people if they're visiting. So if you're out walking at night, you might not even know that there's one next to you. And then you'll hear right under a bush or something, a little, so cats meow, dogs bark and booties fart. That is the noise that they make to communicate with each other. I've never heard that before, but great saying. That is good. It's a farting space rat for next time. I spy something on the left. What is that? This is a southern hairy-nosed wombat. So a lot of people are familiar with our um, more common wombat, wombat which is the bare-nosed wombat. Uh, but we also have two species of hairy-nosed wombat. So the northern hairy-nosed wombat is uh, critically endangered. There's only a couple hundred of them left. The southern hairy-nosed wombat is doing a little better. But all of our wombat species are threatened by this tiny little burrowing mite. So it causes mange and you get these wombats that are looking just like really crusty uh, and it can kill them over time. So we're lucky enough at Yukamara that we have one of the only populations that doesn't get mange. We don't know why that is. And we have a population of about 2,000 wombats on our 5,000 hectare property, which is a really significant proportion of the population here. Who names these things? I like the hairy nose wombat as a name. So there's a push to start using the indigenous names for animals. So things like the burrowing betong, we call it the booty, the brush-tailed betong, we call it the woily. But the thing with the wombat is the wombat is actually the indigenous name for the bare-nosed wombat or the common wombat. So that should just be called wombat by itself. So the indigenous name for this is the wardu, which is not very well used and not very well known, but hopefully if more of us start using it, then um then that could be a better name for it, the Wardu. This was taken by one of the volunteers who came here to do a wombat study. So similarly to our other, like mallee fowl, these are a very difficult species to capture. One of the reasons is that they're, they're huge. They're about 35, 40 kilos. So the way that we monitor them is that we go up to their warrens and then we count how many active entrances each warren has. So warrens can be enormous, like 100 entrances into the one burrow system. However many of those entrances are active, that's how we figure out how many wombats are using that warren. And then we generate a population estimate from that. So they are very cool species. Can you see how like the rump end is kind of, it doesn't look like flat. So all wombats have quite a 
like you can knock on it. It's like a plate on their, their bum. So if they've gone into a hole, nothing's going to be getting in because that's like a, a wall there. The weird thing about the wombats though is their pouch faces backwards. And that seems weird when you think about it, but makes sense when you know what they do, which is digging holes. Wombats are like amazing hole diggers. So if you're imagining a wombat doing this, where's all that dirt going? It'd go into their pouch. So the pouch faces backwards so that it doesn't fill up with dirt. Any other animals you want to talk about? Yeah. So one of the things that we do, we obviously look at a lot of species that we have here behind the fence. So we're making sure that um, they're doing well, they have enough food, they have enough water, termites, whatever it is that we're looking at. Uh, but then we also have a number of properties that aren't fenced. So one of those properties is Dacalantis Sanctuary. It's about 14,000 hectares on the Air Peninsula. That's still on the southern end of Australia. Totally different habitat type. It's still Mallee, but very different kind of Mallee. And so even though it hasn't got a fence, it's still got amazing species there that we're working to protect. So rather than fence the property to keep cats and foxes out, we're using other methods. So things like making sure there's not too many goats or deer, which can trample the soil and stop native species from growing, making sure that the weeds are under control. We have some really dangerous weeds in that area like foxthorn. But amazingly, there's these really cool species that if you were just looking at this sort of habitat, you might not know they're there. But we go in and we put buckets into the ground and then we build fences in between the buckets, just temporary fences so that theoretically an animal at night will run into the fence, scamper along it and fall into the bucket at the end. And then we come along in the morning and see what it is that we've caught. And so I put this together with just some of the species that we caught at Dacalanta. We were there for a month, spending about three days at each site, one by one, seeing what species were around. So our fan favorite is always the Pygmy possum, which is that one in the in the middle on the top. So that's a Western pygmy possum. That is a full grown adult. So that is as big as they get. Apologies for my thumbnail being so dirty, but there's no showers or anything. You're just out there for a month in the dirt camping. So great species. They go into torpor during the day. So that's like hibernation, but just for one day or two days at the most. And they basically just sleep until it's nighttime again. And that helps them conserve energy. So when you catch them, they can look really sad like this, like with the ears down. And we warm them up in our hands to wake them up a little bit so that we can release them somewhere and they don't just get eaten by a snake. But So they do look pretty cute like this for a little while until they wake up. So the other species I've got here in the top left is a legless lizard. So it looks like a snake, but it is in fact a skink. That is a pygopus with one of the interns who was with us for the trip. In the right, I've got a photo of Dacalanta with some of our revegetation projects. And you can see the fence on the bottom part of that photo. There's a gecko in the bottom left that's an underwatersaurus milii. So that's the barking gecko. Before um, you say the one on the bottom right, I want to guess. Is it a worm snake? Oh, I, that could be another name for them. We call them blind snakes. But I think, yeah, worm snakes is another name for them. Nice work. Has somebody else talked about worm snakes before? The, cool. the pile are... of dangerous venomous stuff on the left of that. That is the whiptail snake, yellow-faced whiptail snake just got turned into a new species. So I think it's called the central yellow-faced whip snake now. And so that's actually two snakes all curled up into each other. So we found them in the morning and they're obviously trying to conserve heat by curling up into each other, which is pretty cute. They are venomous, but of all the snake species we have here, that's the one to get bitten by. Like bad, but you probably won't die. So how many people work at your organization? I think it's something around like 200 to 300 employees, but we rely really heavily on volunteers. So when we go out into the fields, like that survey I was just showing you at Dacalanta, there were three staff and then I think seven maybe volunteers. So we really rely on people coming out and spending time with us, which is so important. You know, they don't get, they don't get a salary to be there. They're just doing it because they care about conservation. They want to help. And yeah, we couldn't do what we do without the volunteers. How do people become volunteers? We have a volunteer portal. So if you're interested in signing up, you can go onto the website and sign up as a volunteer. So you can be like, yes, I want to do bedtime time survey. Uh, yes, I want to do numbats or whichever surveys. And then I'll go through and find the people who are most going to, I guess, benefit from doing the survey with us. Do you have any like numbers and data you could show about the populations and problems that the animals have? A couple of the problems that we have, like I mentioned, is that species outside of fences, they often don't do very well because we've got those feral cats and foxes. So we call the problem range the critical weight range of mammals. So things that are around like 
half a kilo to sort of three kilos. That's the critical range of weight. And that's because it's the perfect dinner size for a cat. Those are the ones that are on the edge of extinction and they're the ones that we need to focus on. Inside fences, you start having different problems. So things like as soon as you take cats out of the equation, you get populations that just boom because they all of a sudden don't have this threatening process anymore. They're in a really great habitat. So you can get populations that go too big for the size of the sanctuary. So then you're looking at problems like a lack of food, not enough water for them, maybe you're getting an inbreeding problem. Which Australian animals are most endangered? So this includes populations where maybe there's only one population left. So if you think about one population, even if it's a fairly big population, a couple hundred animals, if there was a disease, if there was a fire, if something happened to that population, there's nothing saving it. It's gone fully extinct. So that's super dangerous. If you have one population, you want to get, you want to put individuals in zoos, you want to get them in breeding programs, you want to put them in other populations, spread it around to try and uh, spread the risk. So if one population fails because of predation or fire or whatever, then you've got insurance populations elsewhere. And then obviously species that have very few individuals left, they're at risk. And species that we don't know a lot about, they're at risk. Because if we don't know where they are, how they breed, what they need to survive, then they're also in trouble. One of the species that I thought was quite interesting this year was the mountain pygmy possum. And the reason that's endangered is because of the bogong moth, which is one of the species it feeds on. So the bogong moth used to be so abundant, just like clouds of them in the air. And just in the last uh, decade or so, they've completely diminished. So because that species is one of our priority species, that rolls on to be a problem for one of our other species, the mountain pygmy possum. So things like that is how a species gets on the list. What are some, what are the three or four top species on the list? I guess I would change depending on who you are and what you're working with. The numbat, bilby and mallyfowl, they're all on the list. So they're species that are at risk of going extinct and they're ones that I work with here at Yukamara to save. But, you know, if you talked with a reptile person, then they might think that the pygmy blue tongue skink is the most important species to look after. That's a skink that's about this big and it lives in spider holes. So it pokes its head out and eats bugs that walk past. And then if you come, it just back into the hole. And it was thought to be extinct for a couple of years and somebody actually found it in the belly of a dead brown snakes. They cut a dead brown snake open, found this extinct species. And that's how we realized that they were still alive and we could still save them. Wait a minute. They they cut open an animal's body and found one in there. Yeah. I'm not going to ask. Yeah, it's a bit gruesome. One of the problems we do face is people taking the habitat of the animal. So we live at this great patch of Mali. It's really old. Like I'm saying, it's about 600 years old. And people in the unfenced areas of Yukamara will just drive in, cut a couple of trees down for their firewood for the year. And they don't, like, they know that it's habitat. They know it's, you know, important. But to them, it's free firewood. So why would they not come in? What do you see for animals that you protect for the next 30 years? So there's a lot changing in the environment we're working in. Fire is getting a lot more common and a lot more intense. So you're getting these massive blazes that are burning whole patches of area to the ground, which is super different to how fire used to happen in the ecosystem, which would be patchy, cool burns from the indigenous people during, like, not during the summer months. So now that we're getting these massive fire events that are taking out whole areas and making it very uniform in age, that's going to be something that we're that we're going to have to focus a lot of our energy on in the next couple of decades. And the other one is the genetics of animals. So with these populations getting smaller and smaller and smaller, the genetics of them is getting less. If the population doesn't have the ability to change their genes to deal with it, then the whole species is at risk of going extinct. So those those are some pretty big issues we're going to be facing in the future. Thank you for talking with me today, Alexandra. Thanks, Micah. Thanks for having me. It was really cool to talk about conservation with you. And thank you for watching. You can help animals by hitting the like button and subscribing to this channel. I'll see you next time on Nature's Guardians. Bye.